We're going to record to this. Hey, hey, I'm glad we had this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> now, now my only concern is I missed the whole idle, idle, idle thoughts of an idle uh, sonographer, and I wanted to share with you what I may have already before. Um, in order to best put this into context, and, and we're going to need to do this sometime, is is who you are and who I am and the various cultures, uh, imaging and, and even, I absolutely could listen to your daughter talk all day. The way she was appealing to her father, the, the, the accent and everything, I, I was just going, oh my goodness, you even have proper etiquette even when that <laughs> <laughs> it was phenomenal. So I guess what I'm saying, speaking to my friend in London, John Letty, um, I was, um, I looked at my emails and from 2000 and I believe 11 or 2012, I have an email where I reached out to you. You were, you were working on a newsletter that seemed like it was attempting to bring about a group of, uh, of, of physios over there or, or something. And I have no idea how I even... I got your contact name or whatever from this this thing on on some kind of newsletter. It was saying identify what the images were, and out of the blue, I said I know maybe one of these, but I'm going to try to act like I know some of these. And I sent in something, and and then I somehow connected with you, and I got mm -hmm. on the phone, and, and 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 that's what started this whole thing. I said I have no. I have no friends that are into this over here in the U.S., this yeah. crazy group of people. Uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you for just a little bit because back then you were serving as what? What, 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 what? what? Well, back then I was a superintendent in a radiology department running an ultrasound department. And, uh, uh, but, and not at the time working as a physio at all. Uh, I just stopped working as a physio to go full time in sort of uh, ultrasound management in a department. Uh, and because uh, you just it, enjoyed ultrasound, or because you were working as a traditional physio prior to I, that, I had been working as both. I had for many years, even at that stage, I'd been working as a, as as a sonographer half my week and as a physiotherapist the other half of my week. So I was working in radiology doing full range of uh, musculoskeletal, gynecology, uh, abdominal ultrasound. I hadn't done any obstetrics in a long time, uh, except in sort of emergency obstetrics, uh, things like early pregnancy. Uh, so, uh, and that's, uh, by the time you got in touch with me, that's the stage I was at. I was, uh, I was still very closely involved with the physios in the UK that were doing uh, that was Mark Maybury and, 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 and Gary something. I, I forgot who the other guys were that I, 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 I tried to connect to, too. But there, the, there, were, there, there, there have been a bunch of us for a while. And, uh, and we had an organization called the Dynamic Ultrasound Group, uh, which I chaired. And, uh, and we were trying to provide sports, running courses uh, for, uh, for physios and other clinicians. But uh, very much point of care. Uh, though we didn't use that term at the time. Yes, yes. So, so we but were, but when did that start? Would you say in, in 2000? Or, I mean, how, how long? About 2004, I think we started. Uh, and uh, I'd done some teaching around about, around about then with uh, uh, a very good shoulder surgeon called Len Funk. Uh, and uh, Teaching ultrasound or teaching just physio? Teaching, teaching ultrasound uh, of the shoulder. Uh, initially, uh, to essentially shoulder surgeons. Fifteen uh, years ago, John. <laughs> it it doesn't seem that long ago, really. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, we were we were uh, uh, teaching ultrasound to the to the shoulder surgeons uh, because we thought it just made sense what we were doing in radiology or what I was doing in radiology um, felt like only half a job. And, and only able to, you know, having to pass on a little bit of information in a, in a written report to the surgeon, to the surgeons, to the, to the physios, to, to the uh, GPs, as opposed to being able to integrate what you were looking at uh, with all its complexity uh, into your uh, clinical examination. 
and before I went full time in radiology, which is when you uh, got in touch with me, I'd actually bought my own little scanner just so that when I worked as a physio, I would have a scanner there because it made no sense to me for me to have these skills and to be just using them in radiology. And At that a, time, the, the little scanner, was it um, a, a transportable one or was it a cart system yeah. one? Or? No, it was, it was a little uh, Micromax. It was one of the late uh, edition uh, Sonocyte Micromaxes. Oh, okay, yeah. Where, which, despite not being considered top of the range, was about the most robust quality picture you could get on a portable at the time. For, wow. the, for the likes of me, it wasn't as pretty as some of them. But uh, some my, my students still borrow it, and after they've got used to using it, they still love it. Well, I just got off a webinar with the person who owned Sonosite at the time. He's rolling out a new company called Echonos, yeah. We're using artificial intelligence, and it was just phenomenal. They did a demo with their new device called the Cosmos with me, and yep. it is it is blow your mind amazing. And they're they're identifying dynamically, even the quality of the plane that you're on, and they're identifying with with annotations. It's just I don't know where this is going to go from here. But backing up to history, yes. <laughs> I'd say Sonicide had. Uh, very good compounding on their uh, on their little portable uh, that was uh, that gave them an edge over everything at the time. Certainly at that price point and in that reliability, I used to carry it around. You know, it fit in a rucksack and uh, and was pretty pretty bulletproof as well. So so it was perfect for a scanner. At that, that you time, had. were you diagnostic predominantly, or were you doing any interventional injections yourself? Or how, how, tell me about that. I was uh, I was doing some injections in radiology. I was not as, doing as a sonographer or as a physio sonographer. Or did they have ESP at that time too? They didn't really have. You know, I was I was in radiology as a sonographer, and I just told them I could do injections, and uh, or I was able to, and uh, they watched me do a few, and they said, "Crack on." <laughs> and I'd done. I'd I'd been a clinical specialist in a quite an, a well established shoulder unit, the Reading shoulder unit. Uh, so I knew my way around shoulders, and they started me off just doing shoulder injections uh, in the radiology department as as just a member of the radiology team, as a sonographer, uh, which in the UK is a little bit different to what it is in in the US. I think. Uh, yes. But I would do injections there, and and then. Once they got used to giving me shoulders to do, they started putting other things on my lists, including sort of prosthetic hips and all sorts. I was just going to say, when I was over there visiting you, I remembered distinctly a story where, where I believe because of your prowess in the shoulder and your acumen in, in musculoskeletal, they just kind of pointed you to the hip and said, all right, go for it, or, or something like that. It was this element of almost, look, um, you have an injection next, and, and you said, well, I, I know my echo texture. Uh, tell me that story again. Didn't you have a, 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 a birth by fire to the hip? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I was working in the radiology department. They had no illusions as to my limited experience or expertise. I'd, a hip had come through on my ultrasound list, and uh, I'd identified, to everyone's surprise, a large uh, mass or collection in the post posterior hip region. and. Uh, and the surgeons requested an aspiration of it. And you know, I was pretty skeptical that there was anything that could come out in there. Uh, and, uh, and I was concerned by all the uh, you see, infection control issues associated with injecting or sticking a needle anywhere around these areas. And so I talked to my clinical director and said, you know, I, never done anything like this before uh, is is it an accident that it's on my list and they said no you seem to know how to point a needle <laughs> and a probe so, <laughs> or so, a scanner. Said, I've, never, I've never seen anything like it before and they said well you know you should just get on and do it and, <laughs> you, know, it was, it was, uh, you you kind of think about the the objections that people put up to sort of non-medics 
uh, doing anything in our country and presumably everywhere else. Yeah. And then you get to a point where they don't want to do it. Yeah. They just let you do it or they ask you to do it. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 have, you have greater skill to, to do that. You might as well uh, be in charge of doing the other. And I think that's one of the things that distinguish you as my mentor in the area of imaging because you preceded the – the, the, the branded names like SonoSkills or, or uh, MSK Ultrasound or even Smug. And, 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 and as you're seeing, a, a commoditizing or monetizing of this information uh, out of necessity because there's so many people so incredibly hungry to learn how to do this stuff. Uh, and at that time, they were just simply saying, "Ah, give it to Letty. He'll 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 pull the black out of that sh <laughs> that hip." <laughs> I got nothing out of that hip. <laughs> oh, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> because it was. Did you think it was too gelatinous, or or why was it uh, darkened like that? It, it, it was probably just a big old hematoma. Ah. Uh, that solidified, uh, but they didn't think it was cancerous, and it yeah. may well have been. Uh, some sort of early uh, pseudo tumor that you get around the hips, uh, wow. but I think the patient's had a fall. This is many, many years ago. The beautiful thing about what I would like to at least do with these random musings or um, idle, idle. Th say it again. The idle thoughts of an idle sonographer. <laughs> that's what it is, and I think that's kind of what bumped me into wanting to talk a little bit about your own history. And I'm not done there yet because. I believe you had an integral part in developing or lifting the, the, the knowledge of the providers in, in your region just based on you being uh, a credible sonographer in the area of so many areas in radiology that musculoskeletal, as it grew, I believe that you had that, um, the, the credibility of having been in there. And from that, allowed for the profession of physiotherapy to to have a bounce point into where they're they're now doing that um, uh, across the board. I want to spend a little bit of time with that, but I want to get back to the, the 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 fact of what bounced me back to your history or that pushed me back to your history. You had said the randoms, the random. Uh, I'll get it one of these times, John. But it 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 ended up being of an idle sonographer, mm -hmm. and in the U.S our entire system of medical oversight or, or protective zones of, of that's my area and, and you're getting into my turf. It, it does require that we identify the, the, the titles of the specialists that we're working with. And a sonographer here in the U.S., is a designation of a medical professional that has had the basics, the academics of how ultrasound works, and then they have gone on to specialize through clinical practice to be the acquirer of images that are then provided to the radiologists, and it's the radiologist that ultimately deems their images to be of quality and the, 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 the report that they generate to be worth um, the expense of that procedure as they then do the overread. So the sonographer is relegated to being a very skilled acquirer of certain protocol-based images so that the radiologist in that dark, quiet closet that they live in can then take a look at those pictures and identify the pathology based on that. They're the sonographer is relegated to being the, the robotic hand that images the robotic slice and provides that for a radiologist to read. When a medical specialist, like a physical therapist, like a podiatrist, like a, uh, any of the uh, mid-level and above providers use ultrasound in a point of care in the United States, their, their title, is a sonologist and that the difference between a sonographer and a sonologist 
has to do with the fact that a sonographer is an occupation that gathers images to be read by the, the, the radiologist, and a sonologist uses those images in point of care. And I'm sorry to belabor that, but I wanted to at least identify the fact that when you say a sonographer, I sadly am throwing you a rope to say, no, come up to my high level of status as a yeah. sonologist because you rock and, 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 and I disparage the sonographers in this country who have much bigger heads than mine on actually how to do sonography. Am I making any sense to you? There's that weird. Yes, but it is, um, it, it has, it's a, um, ultrasound sonography has has grown in a, in a very different different field in a, in a much more perhaps a much more fertile area from from a sonographer's perspective in the uk and uh, and actually in europe you will find that the term sonologist has pretty much died out because there was we did use this uh, or, or it was a, a common term uh, when i first started you know 20 years ago maybe and uh, where some radiologists were described as sonologists or would describe themselves as sonologists uh, and uh, the sonographers were the technicians and that's how it started in the U uk but because of the nature of the nhs uh, and uh, always looking to save money as sonographers became more competent in the uk uh, the radiologists end up not reporting their images and the reports were just accepted per se until the point when I came along it was deemed inappropriate for someone else to read your pictures so as a sonographer you were expected right from the day one you were trained to report independently and there were only a very small number number of units in the whole country where sonographers would expect a radiologist to report and that was 20 years ago uh so and probably for some considerable time before but in a uh, a growing number of uh, locations and so ultrasound in the uk is an independent uh practitioner in practice there were some uh, residue of this sort of when i first started so i remember one of my bosses uh reporting a uh, a dvt but describing thrombus in the superficial femoral vein and it became uh important because this was read by a junior doctor who thought the superficial femoral vein was a superficial vein and so didn't treat the dvt and and when we discussed it the sonographer who was a very old school sonographer at the time uh felt that she couldn't call it a dvt because she was a sonographer and so she was only felt that she should describe whereas me being a, a generation after her uh would never dream of describing thrombus in a vein i would just say there is a dvt there because you know it, and you know my attitude coming yes. to my air traffic terms, where yes. it's not it's not what you say it's what they hear and so you don't say there's thrombus somewhere you say there is a dvt because that's what they need to know and to respond to and that should be in in the first line of, of any what, report. What, what you just alluded to i want to at least if the viewers happen to hear this i i'm going to be having i want to develop an entire little small video on what you just said and that is that john letty comes from a background of an air traffic controlman and where do the delivery of intent of what you need to have that particular individual do must be 100 percent accurate in the way it's transferred from the person saying it to the person receiving it and so there there are total issues that i desperately want to get into because it's so information rich to the get your hands dirty clinician and yep. it is not even expressed in the academics of accomplishing a certification and it really has to do with the, the the absolute delivery of correct information from one party to the next and and that's what you were referring to when you said as you know my background in 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 
in air traffic control. And it's going to have a lot to do with reporting and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I want to totally get into that, but I, I want to, even before that, talk further about the contribution that you made over there uh, in, at, in the present team of providers, because it doesn't take long for anybody who's getting into the musculoskeletal arena, particularly of education. Uh, UK, because of your long history of MSK use, uh, have refined at least the musculoskeletal assessment using ultrasound uh, sonography to do that. But there are several different venues of that education. What, what's presently on the landscape over there to the common physiotherapist if they want to learn how to do it right now? We don't have a firm uh, pathway, a, 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 a single pathway to competence or use of ultrasound in the UK. And to a certain extent, I'm guilty of being a, a factor in that, in that uh, over the years, uh, the society uh, have asked why that why we don't have uh, firm gu uh, sort of formal guidelines uh, to say physios need to do this or that or the other. And the reason has been that resources for education are so limited that anything we came up with, you know, 10 years ago, would have been so prohibitive to be if it was to be accepted by the radiology community and the medical community as a path to competence it would be so prohibitive in terms of finding mentors uh, that it 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 would create too high a barrier so we don't have a fixed barrier for entry into ultrasound and in the uk use of ultrasound is is not restricted you know there's no law that says you can or can't use an ultrasound machine as a phys physiotherapist as as any profession as a joe blogs on the street or anything there is there is no there are no regulations there's no regulation of the use of ultrasound a a a um an electrician well, i guess that would even be better but but a, a plumber could could go out and get buy an ultrasound device and utilize it and and but not utilize it in an information gathering way and charge people for it. No, well, there, he, there was, um, let's say, the, it's a bit like the English, British Constitution. Uh, the restrictions are there. They're not necessarily written down. They are, they're implied. Uh, you can't, a physiotherapist can pick up an ultrasound machine. He can use an ultrasound machine. But he's restricted in his practice by his professional indemnity and by his registration, that he needs to ha be competent to do whatever he does. Yeah, and it's a it's a fascinating thing. I I I, I remember watching some of your colleagues put ESP behind their name um, when they uh, logged into LinkedIn, and I was so envious because I desperately wanted to become an ESP that I reached out to two or three of them that did it. And they would all come back with, "Well, I'll send you an email," and, and you know, would not would not send it to me. And, and I finally, uh, you know, on a chat, talked to him. I, said, I I I want to come over there. And if, is it a year long thing to be an ESP? Or and and the answer was, "Well, no, you're competent when you say you're competent." And, and I said, uh, uh, "You're going to have to help me out again with that." But the ESP would be an extended scope phys physiotherapist. And it allows a person at some point in time to actually be doing injections and be doing things outside of the normal for a, you're shaking your head. Help me out here, buddy. <laughs> it's not the SP is a, a descriptor. It's it's when your role is not a standard physiotherapy role. It, it has elements that are not considered or weren't considered uh, normal practice, standard practice. And so it has gone out of fashion uh, for various reasons, partly litigation because the things that uh, the physios are doing are not are covered within our registration generally these days, uh, such as injections. They're not and or they are covered? They are covered, yeah. but they're not taught at an undergraduate level. So they're not taught as, as standard physio training but they are within the scope of practice of 
physios. So the term extended scope became slightly uh, less appropriate over the last half a decade. Uh, but originally it was uh, doing injections. It was listing people for theatre, which was one of the first real extended What scope. that actually means to me, you need to understand, when you say theatre, I believe you're talking about the surgical suite and listing people, meaning you're going to be triaging them to be going to surgery. Is that correct? Yeah, that was one of the things that the uh, early extended scope physios uh, in some of their scope, in some of their roles, would would be doing so. They would be screening for you need surgery, you don't need surgery, you need surgery, like an uh, a, a, a in an orthopedic clinic. Yes, in an orthopedic clinic, they would they would see a patient, uh, and they would perhaps say, you know, we've they've got a rot. I think this patient has a rotating cuff tear. Uh, they don't need to see the surgeon who is my colleague in the next room. Uh, I'm just going to put them on the list and they can have a subacromial decompression plus or minus. I'm going to back uh, up just a couple, half a minute. You, you, you stuttered a bit when you said they have a rotator cuff and then you said, I think they have a rotator cuff. I'm, I'm playing on my sensitivity to why you made that switch. Well, because um, I'm so used to always knowing whether someone's got a rotator cuff or not. Because, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you were looking back and saying back then maybe they didn't know for back sure it wasn't it wasn't that you would know that there was a rotator cuff oh, i've got you i'm you, with you on that they, they it didn't meet the, the criteria of i got you having uh, appearing to have a rotator cuff tear and therefore at the time we did an awful lot of subacromial decompressions plus or minus depending on what they found when they went in with the scopes uh because our our medical service, they didn't all get MRIs before they went for surgery and ultrasound was, uh, back in the old days, was fairly patchy in terms of um, sort of quality and availability. So there are individuals now um, who, though the ESP has fallen out of, of use, it's just an assumed component of individuals who are physi physiotherapists who are more subspecialized in the area of um, sonography, but it also could apply for somebody who's a, who, who's a subspecialized in an area of like pelvic floor, or could it apply to other areas in physiotherapy other than MSK? Yes, and, and ultrasound is only a, a very small compo component of that group. Uh, for the most people who work in the area, they're working in a uh, certainly in musculoskeletal, the role that most physiotherapists who use that to title or use the title would be working in a role where they are working within a musc what's called a musculoskeletal service, either within an orthopedic department or within uh, primary care, uh, where the, we have musculoskeletal services where the physiotherapists are uh, seeing the patients not to do physiotherapy on them, but assessing them as the orthopedic surgeon or the uh, rheumatologists might have done in previous years uh, or the specialist GPs, seeing the patient sent in from the community by the general practitioners, uh, needing a musculoskeletal assessment to perform injections or to assess whether they need to go to surgery or whether they need podiatry or whatever. So in a role that is more about the diagnostics. Yes and the patient management rather than actually performing physiotherapy. So they will, people, they will triage and, and select based on a differential diagnosis that they're processing to decide yeah. whether they send them for injections or plain films or, or something else. And that would be another rule. I found distracting that throughout Europe, they will identify, some therapists identify themselves as MSK, physical therapists. But when I look further, it has nothing to do with ultrasound, which again is an across the board in some circles definition of musculoskeletal ultrasound if you use MSK. But what they're doing is simply saying they have this specialty in musculoskeletal as you've just outlined. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, musculoskeletal is is the term we use for uh, medicine. You know, ortho, what would traditionally be called orthopedic medicine. So, so they would they would be selectively involved in orthopedic medicine as a as a team player at a level different than your common um, neighborhood physiotherapist. No, we um, 
it's a term that's evolved, but we used back in my days, uh, junior days in physio, they were called outpatient physiotherapists. So it was anyone, all the patients who were being, who could walk into a, a physiotherapy yes. department and yes. see. The vast, the, the vast majority of them would be for orthopedic, you know, for back pain and neck pain and limb pain. And all that is all clumped together and called the MSK, certainly in, in the UK. Uh, and then you have neurology, which is separate for that, and women's health that is separate for that, that are also often outpatient uh, based. But those are, are the three main fields. And that uh, would be extended scope physiotherapist in those fields. No, an MS, you would call, if, if you were a standard physiotherapist, what we think of a, a, as a physiotherapist, uh, in working in private practice or within the healthcare service uh, in an outpatient department, you would be an MSK physiotherapist these days, as opposed to uh, a neuro neurological or a respiratory physiotherapist. So that it's just what we know, most of us in, in physiotherapy think of as normal physiotherapy. It's, uh, is, is called MSK physiotherapy in the UK. And then an extended scope MSK physiotherapist is someone who works in one of these jobs where they're not actually treating the, the patients. Or not I've got to get into that, John, because that's you. Because that, that's, yeah. that, that's what I want to talk about now, because that's yeah. really, uh, I, I enjoy you as a human. I also enjoy the fact that you are a physiotherapist, and I get that but I'm most drawn to you for your brain power in the area of musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging. And yes. what's amazing is that um, I, when I went over there to London, I, I, I contacted you and you said, well, I have a list of people I'm doing injections on. And I believe that list had this staggering number that you gave me. I, I, I hesitate to even say how many people you had said were on your list. So on a given day, John, you are 100% of the time doing diagnostic along with, at your discretion, injections or what we would call interventional um, um, CSI or cortical steroid injection. Tell me about your day because this is what takes you beyond the field of MSK physiotherapy and solidly into what I would normally have called an extended scope practitioner, correct? Yes, that, that's my, my work is, is and was very varied. And over the, the years you've known me, uh, I've, I've been in different roles. Uh, after I finished in the uh, uh, working as a superintendent and manager in, in an ultrasound department, I, I worked uh, for a while as, uh, which is another unusual term for, uh, uh, from your perspective, is a consultant sonographer, which is... Uh, uh, within a hospital, and it's a, a more senior sonographer, a sonographer that is, I think, in principle, working at a comparable level to a radiologist. I think that's it's, um, but it basically that was an interventional role, and a lot of the time now, when I do work in hospitals, uh, which varies dependent on the uh, economic climate as to how short of short-handed they are, I will do a list that is all injections or all planned injections for the radiology department. So these are not patients I'm choosing whether they need an injection or not. Oh, this is they're, they're, they're on your list as these have been deemed that, and you have to put the, 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 the probe. Do you call it probe? Yeah. Okay. Put the probe on, on, on the patient in the correct orientation so that you can minimize the amount of time for you to deliver the injection, identify the structure, and then come out of there. Am I wrong in saying those lists can sometimes be on a busy, busy day? 40? No. No. How many? And, um, I'd, some colleagues do uh, have been known to do lists that many. I will do, uh, on a busy day, uh, 40 diagnostic scans. Four zero, John. You are yeah. my hero. <laughs> no, they're, 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 not fourteen. He said no, forty. But they're diagnostic scans. They're not in, injections. Yes, but diagnostic means that you have to identify the area you're looking for and determine whether there's pathology there. Yes. But a bit, but it, but in the UK, at least, if I'm if I'm doing an injection on on a patient, yes. I have to do that anyway. So yeah, okay, if, okay, okay, if, okay, okay. If I'm doing an if I'm doing an injection list in radio, even in radiology, I still 
do a, a, an, a diagnostic scan of the of that patient for the area. I also take a history because I'm because I'm responsible. I'm not a t technician when you do an injection. Uh, you are responsible for the decision to make the injection uh, and to perform the injection and to uh, uh, consent. And we have to consent the patients. Given yeah. That, get informed consent from the patient. So you're, you're taking a medical history, you're, you're doing a diagnostic scan, you're making sure that the injection is appropriate. Now there is a different level of appropriateness when it's been requested by an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, I bet there is. To what I do on a day when I might only have 14 patients, when I'm expected to, in a different role, where, where I work ah. in a, a musculoskeletal service, where we'd, we have 10, 12, 14 patients on, on a list. But there you are doing, you are taking a, a full history, you are discussing with the patient and deciding what needs to be done. And then if some, something needs to be done, you need to get on and, and do the injection with all the consents. And that you takes have a much off. broader filtering system through a broader um, differential diagnosis processing yeah. than you would if they've been worked through a radi I mean, a, a orthopedic surgeon and they were coming to you for a lateral collateral ligament uh, uh, tear or something like that. They, 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 they turn up from orthopedics uh, typically uh, with a request to perform any of the standard injections, whether it's a, a stripping, a barbitage or whatever. Uh, and and they've already been worked up. They've already, if they, they need to be consented on the day, but they're already expecting an injection. And that's the decision from the clinical team as to what the management is. When we work in the musculoskeletal service, where I get half an hour for each patient, uh, then usually they're coming perhaps with the intention of an injection, but often for a second opinion. You know, this patient has failed normal treatment. Uh, they're sent to see someone like myself uh, for a, a second opinion and a scan and an and a procedure if necessary and that's and that's what takes the extra time it's uh, trying to get all that in and and for me the uh, the developing of the rapport uh, and and setting up of safeguarding and things like that are also critical parts of the procedure so it's an an altogether much more involved and in some ways much more rewarding you yeah, no. you're a lot stressed on your days when i have 12 or 14 <laughs> patients than I am on a pe on a list where I just have forty, you know, uh, scan diagnosed. Buddy, I, I remember report. reaching out to you. I, I forget what it was by text or something, and you came back to me. And my mind remembers seeing forty, forty one on a list. And I and I looked at my wife, and I'm going, I've this guy is 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 my superhero. To 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 even if it was all set up, you know, to just the logistics of doing that. That that's part of many reasons why I'm, I'm eager to get into learning from you in a, in a, in a real world hands dirty, or should I say gelled up uh, a sort of way. I want to ask you this though, of the people who you were that, that you see, how broad is your exposure? Do you do spinal? Do you do SIJ? Do you do TMJ? Do, do you do any type of, you know, how, 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 how broad is your exposure to, you know, imaging abdominally for compression fractures of lumbar vertebra? You know, how, how far out of the, you might say, box will you image on a given week? It depends. I, I do uh, a list in the community for uh, a radiology list in the community. So this is requests from GPs. The, generally can be just about anything uh but there's there's a certain amount of common sense involved so from musculoskeletal point of view it's a lot of lumps and bumps a lot of hernias uh oh really yeah wow so we're talking I, you, you're doing soft tissue stuff that, that, that that's just screening for inguinal hernia or or or, or uh, umbilical hernia. hernias not just the sports hernia that they call that athletic pubalgia or whatever yeah i do i do lots of uh, hernias in fact at, at one stage uh, i had a list that obviously the gp's got a liking for it uh <laughs> but, uh, i would get 20 hernias in a day some some friends of mine who who didn't get to see very many would just turn up on my list and yeah uh, that's so they could see 20 <laughs> hernias. my uh, land i 
I didn't even know you had that wealth of knowledge. I, when, when I come to that, it's like microbiology. I just turn my ears off. And, 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 and with you having that good of information, I'm sure there's some tips that you could help those of us over here because there's only a certain uh, variety of those. And, and uh, wow, I, I would love to be exposed to that. But that would fall under your MSK. Yes, as, uh, as an MSK, uh, it's, it's one of those things. A lot of people, they, they're starting, pe more people are starting to do them. But when I started, no one really did, or very, very few people scanned hernias and liked it. And, uh, and I, I remember back in about 2008, 2009, I was working in a radiology department. And because I was an enthusiast for MSK, uh, I would get anything odd would end up on my list. Uh, and, and I would have a go at it because I was very familiar with the abdominal wall and uh, uh, with having looked at, at all that stuff about transverse abdominus in the 90s and two th early 2000s. And, uh, and so I, I would get all these on my list. And I, and I realized very quickly, I hadn't a clue what I was looking at with a hernia and I couldn't find anyone else who did. And so I did the only thing you can do which is I turned up in, in the mortuary and <laughs> sat in on post-mortems and, and got the nice, friendly pathologist to show me what was going on. And then I chatted my way uh, into some registrar lists uh, with the general surgeons and started to just get my head around the anatomy. And now people, people do teach it and do teach it quite well. But at the time, we were just... I was literally just trying to find the... The, the natural anatomy wow. and just figuring my way around. And, you know, I would call them and I don't know whether I was calling them right or wrong, but I would just, I figured out a way of doing it, which isn't the way they do it now. It isn't the way I do it now. Everyone uses the inferior epigastrics to, uh, to find the deep ring. And that is by far to my mind, the best way of doing it. But it, at the time the machines weren't as good and, and seeing the deep ring wasn't as easy in those days. So what I used to do was because I did enormous number of testes scanning, I would scan the vas deferens, I would scan up the tubes up from there, and I would find my inguinal canal literally by coming up off the off the scrotum and following the vessels up through there, and it'd be hey presto, that would that would be your anatomy. And you're a gold I mine, Letty. I don't even know what you're talking. Well, I do know what you're talking about, but I, I tell you, I've scanned one of those uh, i was looking for the mesh that seemed like it was uh, off of out of where it should be and and i i just we'll we'll get into that for sure and you, know, but, you know when you scan the meshes if, if if ever you do it again uh one of the things i and it isn't always true but if you turn the um the frequency down rather than up you find the mesh becomes more obvious and I, i'm not exactly sure why but, but so that, that's just another thing I've got to write down because I want we, we, we need to have this nugget, this pearl. We'll call them the random or the, the I, random. idle. I, I want to because you have such an unorthodox view of those of us that get giddy that the frequency is getting above 15. And you just you just kind of roll your eyes and say, you poor fools. But I want to yeah. get into what 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 the issue is about about that, because. I want to remind myself and anybody who happens to be viewing that you have a foundation of training in sonography. So you understand beam width. You understand focus. I can barely remember the words of that, let alone know how it applies from a physics standpoint. So yeah. to me, you're a wealth of information well, well below, foundationally below what I'm popping off of, of acting like I know here, but I, I want to get back. I want to get back to the issue of your lists of, yeah. of your day. Would you say, because you've become a guru of, of hernias, you do 50% hernias or are, are, will you do plantar fascia? Will, will you do, you know, a, a plantar plate? Will, will you look at a, uh, um, uh, you know, sesamoid um, itis? Yeah. How, how broad is your, is your day? Um, it it's everything and it's different on every, on every different day so my typical monday is lots of lumps and bumps uh lots of uh lipomas uh uh in this, what did you uh, say that last one was what, what, what was uh, the first so lipomas oh lipomas uh, yeah looking hyaline cysts uh I'm anything like that absolutely 
anything that's uh, that uh, is undeterminable uh, from clinical examination. Incredible. Up on the list. Yeah. So, and, so uh, you, you look at, hey, hey, doc, what is this? I don't know, but go see John Letty. Yes, basically. <laughs> Isn't that, so I'm key, I'm listening. And that's that's out in the community in uh, in a place called the Cotswolds, where I do uh, some work for the GPs there. And then the rest. Wait a of the minute! Week, wait, wait, Cotswold isn't that where the uh, isn't that where the oldest uh, bar is, and, and where they they filmed um, um, the 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 Harry Potter series and that kind of thing? Isn't that where Hogwarts was and all that? I think so. Yes, but I'm not. <laughs> sure. You'd have to ask my kids. You're, this is just all of the day's work, and I paid four hundred pounds to go and see the Cotswolds when I was there visiting you, and you you go there to work. Well, you. If, if you told me what you, you you could have come on a Monday and you you could have come and sat watch me do forty patients, I would love to see that, and I'll be over there sometime soon to do just that. But besides lumps and bumps, keep going. But that's a, that's my Monday. The rest of the week, I work for several musculoskeletal what these musculoskeletal services where they're seeing what you would describe as more MSK patients, more. Uh, orthopedic medicine patients and so I will scan you know foot and ankle everything from plantar plates Morton's uh, up to, uh, lots of midfoot OA uh, quite a few ankle injuries Achilles anything in the calf uh, around the knee anything around the hip uh, and uh, and sometimes into the buttocks but uh, I'm not a, a exponent of uh, spinal ultrasound uh i know my what name about tos what, what about cervical uh, outflow what about any any type of of issues up neck um you know as it relates to thoracic outlet syndrome and and scalene uh, muscle compressions and that kind of stuff i that it's not part of my practice it's not that occasionally i get asked to look for uh tos um ultrasound is not reliable and I, from my perspective, you shouldn't be sending them to me to do something that is not reliable because it's it's not a it's not a it's not a useful test if it's not reliable. It's carpal like tunnel. What, 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 carpal what about? Tunnel, I scan all the time, uh, and and I would and I would look whenever I look at a hand, I always check the carpal tunnel. Uh, just I because. have yet to do that officially once. It, I, I've it, read so many articles on it, and you're just throwing it out like, yeah, I do that on even the ones I'm looking at, the, the, the pisiform. It takes two, <laughs> it's two, it's two seconds. To okay. It. Well, you're going to be showing that to us sometime yeah. in 11 seconds so that we can see it yeah. in slow motion. <laughs> but it's, uh, and it's, and it's part, for me, it's, it's part of an assessment, uh, not because of, it, of its protocol, but when you have anyone with any hand issues, particularly in, in our population, we're not, I'm not seeing a vast number of, of 21 year old sportsmen. Uh, so, uh, most of my patients are middle-aged. Most of them have usually a spectrum of, of problems, uh, by the time they get to see me because you, because they don't really see me until they failed right quite a number of interventions normally and and so you when you're looking at a hand and they've got pain in the hand you just you you're going to want to run up through the uh the flexor tendons and as you run up through it's actually a really nice guide you know if you think about uh the way i scan i don't scan by protocol so People have these six structures, six six pictures. I love you for that, John. Keep going. <laughs> it, what you do, what I, to me, I, I dissect out each piece, each structure in an area, particularly in a complicated area like, uh, like the wrist or like the back of the knee, and you don't build the pictures no good, for the whole thing, but it's, but if you scan, you put each structure into it. So you, it's almost like you draw in your mind or you scan through in your mind and you put into, into this model in your, that you build in your brain each individual structure. So you optimize the picture and you flow through in short axis each of these structures and, until you've seen all of them. And then what happens is that you see the structure you're targeting well, but all the gray splodges that your brain's 
trying to cut normally when you first start is trying to ignore, they all then have a meaning as well because you've looked at them properly. And then when, when you put them together, that's a smudge because this isn't, but it's still a, a smudge that you become familiar with. And it's like looking around your bedroom and it's just these all things, they, are, they don't all look perfect. What they, makes you yeah. so uniquely desirous of having your random idle musings as part of this is that you use words like random smudges and, and you use stuff that, 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 that is the real world um, uh, terminology that, that, that I want to get into specifically. But John, I need to let you know that you have two adorable children who it's now nine o'clock. No, it's now, yeah, is it nine o'clock or, or after? And their, their dear mother is out and, and, and we're, <laughs> and I've already talked through an hour of your time, but we didn't even get into the subject matter that I prepped you for, but there's far more that I even want to go into. Is there, is there anything you want to finish off on this one before I try to set up another time with you? No, I, I, I could certainly talk, talk for another 10 minutes, but but yeah, but no, I, I would I'm, love I would love to then basically just finish up. Your lists can be on certain days, different ones. You you were yeah. only to I believe Tuesday. If you want to yeah. finish out your day for us, that would be great. Two, or Tuesday, your week. Tuesday is Tuesday to Friday at the moment is that sort of work. So, um, uh, my work evolves. You know, uh, contracts drop off, and and other people uh, want me for for different things. So if I'm if if I am doing some work in radiology, then I will do a radiology list, which will typically be to be eighteen to twenty injections in a day. And that would be that you would be hired as a as a provider of diagnostic imaging and interventional imaging by a group of orthopedists, or is it through the NHS, or how does that work? Typically through the NHS. You know, an, an NHS imaging department will be shorthanded and have a big list, a big waiting list of uh, injections uh, that need to be done under ultrasound guidance. And they will bring me in to, uh, uh, to work my way through some of them. Were you the first person, the first physiotherapist uh, to, to, to do this in, in, in London or in that area? Or how did that uh, have, because there, there are a few that I know by by name that are doing similar things yes. to what you're doing, but but um, did they were were you just a big fraternity of of people who do this for a period of time, or or what? I don't know. I I started uh, back doing them in in radiology probably in about two thousand and nine. I can't remember, but uh, and it was. I just, I could, I was doing injections in orthopedic clinic. Uh, and so I just said to the radiology department, I, I can do these, you know, I've not had any training, but I, but I think I can do them. And they said, well, crack on and we'll watch you do a few. We'll let you watch one and, and we'll watch you do a few. And they said, you know, you can do them. So you're competent, so you can do them. And so that's how I started. Many interventionalists over here in the U.S. Um, go over there, or at least it's kind of the the, the mecca of how to learn um, interventional injections because you guys do them on cadavers through, is it SMUG or, or some organization over there or or Stuart <laughs> Wildman's uh, MSK ultrasounds? Uh, yep. it, it is kind of, it's now the epicenter, at least from U.S. imagers, um, where to go to to learn how to do it, and yeah. uh, we'll we'll explore that too. But you are not you you're not involved in a venue of direct education, other than when you're asked to help or as a um, a supporter of it uh, to the to 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 the group of attendees. Correct? You don't have a particular uh, I, curriculum I, I yourself with both both of those groups that you mentioned, the SMUG. I help out on their uh, injection injection courses, and and then I uh, I'm an external examiner for uh, the other group, uh, the uh, uh, the ultrasound Wildman's MSK group. ultrasound or whatever. It's, yeah, Wildman. Uh, so and you know I know them all of old. Uh, so uh, and they 
they kindly ask me along sometimes to help out. Uh, and, and then I've done some teaching down at the course in Bournemouth. And I've been involved with numerous uh, uh, groups over the years. And I, I go out and help. I've, I've got a young family, so I don't... I, it, it's an awful lot of work to set up your own organisation. Uh, and uh, and as I say, it, I don't have that sort of free time. And they, uh, but I run workshops, uh, sort of evening workshops. For, yeah, I, uh, I see you periodically uh, put out a little flyer in in a very yeah. un um, <laughs> unpretentious kind of uh, way. But you know, I I judge your level of respect amongst your peers there based on the fact that you're hashtagged or at signed in on every relevant communication by name. You know, there'll be organizations and then there's John Letty is, is listed on, on, on the five people. It, it is as though there's a certain element of, oh, and I've got to get this out to John so that he knows too. And, and every time it pops up, I get notified. And, and for that, I'm grateful to have made your acquaintance, John. And I want these to be times when, uh, sadly enough, I'm, I, I will probably be trying to monopolize your time. And I want you to always have the ability to, to, to break in and say, hold up there, uh, chap, or whatever you want to call me, buddy over here, uh, uh, bro. Anyway, hold up. I want to talk to you about, about stuff. And you know you always have that, right, John? I do want to let you go because I don't want to abuse you. And I don't want you to think back on these and go, oh, crud, Fritz is going to call again. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but part of what I really needed to get out there, and you know I've prepped you for it, is how important the discussion that we're going to have the next time on, on how precise terminology matters. And it really matters when we're talking about how you remotely can help me um, where I am in managing the probe, in, in identifying what I'm seeing, and in how I can clearly articulate my findings uh, in, in a real world way, uh, with or without pretension in the way I sound, but delivering the content across. And I'm, I'm really eager to learn that. John, anything else for me? Or do you want to control the conversation for just a bit, buddy? <laughs> no, not, not at all. I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to, I, I like talking about ultrasound. And, I, I, and every, time I, I, every time I talk with you, it makes me think. And, and, that's, and that's the best gift of all. Uh, I agree. And like I told you to begin with, during this time of this uh, pandemic, I guess we would call it, if the only person that benefits from it is me, and if I heard desperately that you might benefit at all, then I feel very happy about the whole thing. So tell your wife, well, don't tell her anything, because she'll never know you, 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 you shirked your parenting duties as long as I've forced you to go up and love on your kids, send them to bed with the extra treat, of an additional whatever and, and take care of yourself, John. I'll reach out to you when we can talk again. Are you cool with that? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're chat. It's good. Okay. And next time, maybe you can get this glamorous. Um, um, yeah. uh, I don't know. You see, you see, um, you know, <laughs> occasionally I look at all, at, at some of the uh, more dubious news channels and, and, and some of the, the specialists <laughs> allegedly that they have on there, their, uh, sort of dodgy rooms in the background <laughs> trying to pass themselves off as someone <laughs> who knows what they're doing. <laughs> hey, great talking right. to you, John. We'll connect again. All the best. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. I don't know how to stop this.